الحمد لله رب العالمين عدد خلقه ورضا نفسه وزنة عرشه ومداد كلماته اللهم لا أحثي ثناعا عليك أنت كما أثنيت على نفسك اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد النبي الأمي الحاشمي وعلى آله وأصحابه البرة الكرام وعلى سائر الأنبياء والمرسلين والملائكة المقربين ثم أما بعد As always we begin by praising and thanking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala For in all actuality there is none other than Allah who is deserving of our utmost gratitude and praise And on this blessed occasion we send the best of salutations upon none other than As-Sadiq Al-Ameen Muhammadur Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Dearest brothers and sisters Today I have the fortunate opportunity to address you on behalf of Ikna Relief, a non-for-profit that is considered to be the most effective and most trustworthy in providing aid and assistance to the needy of this country of ours on behalf of every single Muslim living in the United States of America. And in my khutbah, I want to share with you some sentiments in hopes of inspiring and motivating you so that you may donate generously towards their objectives and initiatives. But in doing so, I am compelled to say that when you and me analyze the happenings of the entire globe, quickly we will identify that the world we are living in has become rather gripped into unprecedented turmoil. From political turbulence to economic instability, social mayhem, anarchy, lawlessness, and the list continues to grow. Now experts have often explained that all of this is simply due to the fact that today the human race has moved away from selflessness to selfishness, from togetherness to self-centeredness, and from mutual growth to individual advancement. And therefore, it is no wonder, as Americans, while living in the 21st century, we are now hearing slogans like the world's richest 1%, has far more wealth than the remaining 99% combined together. A depressing disparity. So while Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had designed and decorated the universe to take care of the needs of every single human being, understand my brother and sister, he never ever created the universe to take care of the greed of every single human being. And sadly, because today thousands upon thousands have decided to live a life of utter greed, want, and desire, it has directly resulted in millions upon millions simply being deprived of their very basic needs. And while this sad state of not just the nation but the entire globe often at times will result in you and me sobbing, complaining, or perhaps worse, even losing hope. The English proverb had said something that is worthy of our reflection. And what is that? Complaining about darkness shall never ever help you, but lighting a candle will. Complaining about darkness shall never ever help you, but lighting a candle will. So my brother and sister, as you sit before me this afternoon, ask yourself, in the midst of the darkness that you and me are encountering locally and globally, what is it that I could do as an individual Muslim that will have a ripple impact in the life of some individual who's going through a crisis in hopes of introducing a positive change in the life of an, uh, uh, in the life uh, 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 a positive change in the times that we are currently living in and here is an amazing example of this 
from the life of the great Khalifa Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu an. Once he was about to conduct a weekly dars in the masjid. He rotates his gaze across the entire room. And he identifies that one specific individual is missing. So he asks in regards to the whereabouts of this person. And a man from the back of the masjid stands up and says, Ya Amir al Mu'minin, be advised and informed that the person you are inquiring about has developed a drinking habit and therefore he's behaving like a pain in the rear end. So we advise you to forget about him and to pretend and act as though he doesn't even exist among the Muslim community. And focus your energy on those who are present, eager, wanting to learn from your knowledge and wisdom. The great Khalifa looked at this man and said, excuse me. Have you lost sight of the fact that we are speaking about one of our very own brethren? And if he has defected and fallen off the radar as his brother, is it not our duty and responsibility to do whatever we can within our ability to bring this individual back onto track? The great Khalifa then sat down and decided to be proactive about the matter. And he wrote a letter to this individual expressing and explaining to him that things will never ever be the same without him. And in that letter, he added a verse from the Quran whereby Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes himself in a very peculiar manner. I am Allah, the Lord Almighty, who will forgive you for the wrong that you have done. Who will accept your repentance. There is none worthy of worship except for me. I will therefore hold you accountable for the good and bad that you have ever displayed on earth. And your return is to none but me. The great Khalifa tasks an envoy and says, go and give him this letter on two conditions. Number one, you must give it personally to him. And number two, you must give it to him when he's sober. فَلَمَّا بَلَغَ الرَّجُلَ كِتَابُ عُمَرَ and when finally the, lap, the, the letter of Umar fell on the lap of this individual, the man began to read and introspect and then he started to cry. And he said, Umar, I salute your vision and foresight. For on one hand, your letter is reprimanding and rebuking me, but essentially it is giving me a glimpse of hope. Naza'a fa ahsan al naza'a. The man repents and becomes one of the most rehabilitated human beings that the world has ever seen till this very moment. He repents and becomes one of the most rehabilitated human beings that the world has ever seen till this very moment. Why? Because my brother and sister upon his rehabilitation, this individual, under the guidance of the great Khalifa Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu an, designed the welfare system that you and I as Americans in the 21st century continue to benefit from. But now imagine... If the great Khalifa was to take the advice of the man who stood up at the back of the masjid and said, forget about him, pretend and act as though he doesn't even exist among the Muslim community, then this individual would have fallen down the road of failure forever and ever. But my brother and sister, reflect for a moment and look at the power of a basic, simple gesture for the well-being of a Muslim who has defected and fallen off the radar. It turned his life around so much, so much to the extent that he introduces a system that the world continues to benefit from today in the 21st century. Imagine the impact that you can have upon communities, nay, upon a society, just by being there for someone who's going through a crisis. And Allah has created us to be there for one another. إِنَّ أَخَاقَ الْحَقَّ مَنْ كَانَ مَعَكَ وَمَنْ يَدُرُّ نَفْسَهُ لِيَنْفَعَكَ وَمَنْ إِذَا رَيْبُ الزَّمَانٍ صَدَّعَكَ شَتَّتَ فِيهِ شَمْلَهُ لِيَجْمَعَكَ 
Ali bin Abi Talib says that the true definition of a brother is the one who will stand by your side through thick and thin, irrespective of the circumstances that you are encountering in life. They will sacrifice their own comfort and desire for your safety, security, and prosperity. Woman is a raybu zaman in Saddaq. And when the circumstances of life have fragmented all of your hopes into tiny little pieces, they will roll up their sleeves, march at the end of the world just to see that you, your brother, has stood on his feet with confidence once again. My brothers and sisters, the following week, Omar ibn Khattab has gathered thousands in the masjid. Referencing the incident from the previous week, he says to them words that need to be carved in stone and hanged in every Muslim home. He says, إِذَا رَأَيْتُمْ أَخَلَّكُمْ زَلَّ زَلَّةً فَسَدِّدُوهُ وَوَثِّقُوهُ وَلَا تَكُونُوا أَعْوَانًا لِلشَّيْطَانِ عَلَيْهِ if you find one of your very own brethren down in the dumps, stand up to rescue them. For their fall is the collapse of the entire Muslim ummah. And rescuing perhaps only one is the deliverance of the entire Muslim ummah. إِذَا رَأَيْتُمْ أَخَلَّكُمْ زَلَّ زَلَّةً فَسَدِّدُوهُ وَوَثِّقُوهُ وَلَا تَكُونُوا أَعْوَانًا لِلشَّيْطَانِ عَلَيْهِ When you find a brother or a sister whose back is against the wall, they feel as though the world is caving into them, stand up and rescue them. For doing so is the deliverance of the entire Muslim ummah. Today, my brother and sister, how many cries of the Muslim Ummah are falling on deaf ears? How many? And we are oblivious to this plight of the suffering of the Muslims locally and globally while we continue living our lives of luxury and desire. Was it not the Arabic proverb who said so beautifully, Sabruka fi musibati how can I translate these words in the English language for you? Sabruka fi musibati khayrum min jazik. Wajazuka fi musibati akhika khayrum min sabrik. It is better for you to persevere over your own pain and agony than for you to moan and groan. And it is better for you to moan and groan over the agony of others than for you to turn a blind eye. Today, over the most trivial of circumstances, we want to make an abundant amount of noise. Why? Because my rights have been violated and infringed upon, but I am dead silent at the cries of others who are suffering and going through anxiety and hardship. Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, Al-Muslimu akhu al-Muslim. A Muslim is a fellow brother to you. La yazlimuhu wa la yuslimuhu. You do not harm him, but at the same time, it is your duty and responsibility not to allow him to fall in a predicament by means of which he shall become harmed. وَمَنْ كَانَ فِي حَاجَةِ أَخِيهِ كَانَ اللَّهَ فِي حَاجَةِ and for those of you who come to the aid and assistance of your fellow brethren by fulfilling their needs of the time, then let it be known to you that it has been promised Allah will fulfill our needs when the time arises. And what more in essence, my brother and sister, could you and me ask for than Allah coming to our aid and assistance when we need it the most just because we came to the aid of those who needed it at, that, at their time of need. وَمَنْ يَسَّرَ عَلَىٰ مُحْسِرٍ يَسَّرَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ فِي الدُّنْيَا وَالْآخِرَةِ And those who provide aid and assistance and relief perhaps through another organization or entity for someone who's going through a crisis, Allah will fulfill your needs and come to your aid and assistance in this life and in the hereafter. So what are we waiting for? Here is an amazing example of this from the life of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Bashir bin Aqraba, 
the hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari makes mention he was nine, maybe ten years old, when he moved to Medina with his father and four or five young sisters. They were raised by a single father because his mother had passed away after giving birth to the youngest child. They come to Medina for you to contextualize it in modern day. They had not yet placed a down payment on a home or given a security for an apartment and the call for an expedition was made and the father joined the ranks of the Muslim army. And as it was a custom back then, the Muslims would go to the outskirts of Medina to welcome their family members back home after an expedition or a battle. Bashir, 10 years of age, imagine this, my brother and sister. He joins some people in the community who are practically strangers to him. And he goes to the outskirts of Medina in hopes of welcoming his daddy back home. Hours go by, he is young and short, he climbs a rock and he's looking right and he's looking left and he's looking right and he's looking left to sight the presence of his father. It's about to get dark, he doesn't see him, he comes to the Prophet, he says, Ya Rasulallah, ماذا فعل أبي? I'm sorry to disturb you, O Prophet of God, but I'm searching for my father, I can't seem to locate him, where is my daddy? The moment is too painful for our Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He gently, modestly ignores him and he turns his back to him. A child being a child, he returns to the rock, he climbs it and he's looking for his father right and left. And now it has become dark. There is no street lights. He knows that everyone has returned except for those that were martyred. So now with a crack in his throat, tears trickling down his eyes, cheeks he comes to the prophet of allah he nudges his knee and he says ya rasul allah maza fa'ala abi i am 10 years old i have five young sisters at home i became an orphan by my mother not too long ago where is my daddy fastakbar wa baka Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he drops on his knees. He profusely begins to yell and scream and cry. Bashir makes mention that the moment I heard this, I knew that in these moments I had also become an orphan by my father at the age of 10, becoming the single guardian to my five young sisters. He says, but I mentioned this story because of what happened next. While he said that his heart had broken into pieces and he lost all hope in life, he suddenly was engulfed in a tight hug by the Prophet And with tears, the Prophet whispers to him in his ear, أَمَا تَرْضَى يَا بَشِيرٌ أَنْ يَكُونَ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ أَبَاكِ وَأَعِشَةُ أُمُّكِ would you not wish and desire, O oh, little Bashir, from these moment onwards, I, Muhammadur Rasulullah, stand in the shoes of your father, and my wife Aisha stand in the shoes of your mother? He said, I swear in the name of the Lord, Azza wa Jal, that these words were sufficient for my motivation and inspiration for the rest of my life to make me one of the greatest Sahabi that ever lived. The message to all of you on the day after Thanksgiving is identify someone who is going through a crisis and tap their life in a positive way. By donating this afternoon before you leave to Ikna Relief, be rest assured that you will be providing a helping hand not to one the likes of a Bashir, but to thousands upon thousands who are in need. Just to give you a glimpse, my brother and sister, what is Ikna Relief's initiatives of the past year? They came to the aid and assistance of 300,000 individuals that were in need of zakah. And after the application was approved, they were given help. Some needed a transplant, others needed to pay their rent, and the list goes on. They have come to the aid and assistance of hundreds and thousands through 50 free food pantries across the entire nation. 
20 women shelters across the entire nation. 11 refugee empowerment centers across the entire nation. 7 free clinics across the entire nation. 6 family counseling centers across the entire nation. Hundreds and thousands of free school giveaways to those who are in need. And they're the only Muslim organization that is federally recognized providing aid to people that are afflicted by disasters, natural disasters, contracted by FEMA directly. And as I speak to you, they are in the front lines in California putting out the fire on whose behalf every Muslim in the United States. Yesterday, they were rolling, uh, rowing boats in the Carolinas, taking people out of their homes to shelter because of the uh, mass flooding. Last year, they were in the front lines in Houston and continued to build homes for those who were affected by the storms and the disaster in Houston. And the list goes on. The only Muslim organization, brothers and sisters, that is doing work on this caliber and whether you donate 10,000, 5,000, 1,000, 100 or 1 dollar, be rest assured that you will have a share in all of the khair that they are doing on behalf of the Muslim ummah today. So when you leave, take a pledge form. Make a donation of some sort. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, وَمَا تُنْفِقُوا مِنْ خَيْرٍ فَلِأَنفُسِكُمْ وَمَا تُنْفِقُوا مِنْ خَيْرٍ يُوَفَّ إِلَيْكُمْ وَأَنْتُمْ لَا تُظْلَمُونَ That what you give is for your own benefit. And what you give, Allah will return to you. So when we have such promises, what is going to hold us back? I share with you a few things and end this khutbah and then I will tie it up in the next khutbah with a short story. Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, إِدْخَالُ الصُّرُورِ عَلَىٰ قَلْبِ الْمُؤْمِنِ one of the greatest benefits of dispensing charity is that it instantly puts a smile on a needy person's face. Inna lil masakin dawla. On an yawm al qiyamah, the masakin, the poor people, will have dawla, meaning direct access to Jannah with the ability to take with them whomsoever they desire. So Allah will say to them, Unzuru man at'amakum fi Allahi luqma. Go and search for those who gave you a morsel to eat when your belly was empty in the dunya. And go and search for those who quench your thirst when you had no water. And go and search for those who clothe your body when you were naked in the dunya. Grab them by their hands and enter with them in Jannah. This is an opportunity, brothers and sisters, to be among those who Allah calls upon and says, that those who perpetually give in charity will be among the warithin of Jannah, the inheritors of Jannah. Why? Because inheritance is a contract that is irreversible. Give today and your name will be written on the gates of Jannah to Al-Firdaus. Abu Laytha Marqandi Rahmatullah alayhi says, وَلَوْ لَمْ يَكُنْ فِي الصَّدَقَةِ فَضِيلَ سِوَى دُعَاءَ الْمَسَاكِينَ لَكَانَ الْوَاجِبِ that if there was no reward for dispensing charity other than the dua of the masakin, it would have been enough for you to give charity as it being incumbent. Brothers and sisters, let me end this khutbah with one statement of a great muhaddith by the name of Mufti Muhammad Gangohi Rahmatullah Alayh. A great muhaddith that lived in the early era. He was sitting with his disciples and his students in the masjid and a poor man came into the masjid begging for money. He took out his wallet and gave him 200 rupee, the South Asian currency. And the man left. So his disciples and students said, with all due respect, Ya Sheikh, you could have given him 2 rupees or 20 rupees. You gave him 200 rupees. You are spoiling his taste. He will keep on coming. The Sheikh said something thought-provoking. I will say it in the Urdu language and translate it for you. He said, when I was about to dispense my charity to this man, a thought came to my mind and I thanked Allah that today I am among those who can give charity and not on the receiving end of charity. Barakallahu lana. 
ولكم في القرآن العظيم ونفعنا وإياكم بالآيات والذكر الحكيم استغفر الله لي ولكم ولسائر المسلمين فاستغفروا إنه الرحمن الحمد لله غافر الذنب وقابل التوب شديد العقاب ذي التول لا إله إلا هو إليه المصير أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله المصطفى صلى الله وسلم وبارك عليه وعلى آله وصحبه ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين وبعد Very 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 quickly It's an amazing story it's about 50 pages long. I will give you the abbreviation of this story to put into context the message that I'm trying to deliver this afternoon. It is a story about Ummi Salama along with her husband. They were considered to be among the first ten to become Muslim. Unfortunately, when they became Muslim, this was a time that the Quraysh were up in arms, subjecting the believers to the greatest scrutiny. They left for Abyssinia, and when they arrived in Abyssinia, تتابعت الأخبار على المهاجرين إلى الأرض الحبشة بأن المسلمين في مكة قد كثر عددهم. They receive information that hostility has reduced in Mecca, and uh, the situation is a lot more better than it was previously. Without settling in for the night, they embark on this difficult, harsh journey of weeks through the desert, coming back to Mecca, only to discover the information they had received was fake news. So now for several years, they will be tortured by the Quraysh, and an opportunity again for migration opens up for prosperity, this time to Medina. And she says, Ummi Salama, that I was now with my husband and a newborn baby. They embark on this journey as they are about to leave Mecca. They are ambushed by both of their families. And she is taken into house arrest. Her husband is beaten up and he escapes to Medina for the preservation of his iman. And her child is abducted and taken by her in-laws. So that which was a unity of three is now divided in three different locations. She manages to convince them a year later. She re-embarks on a journey to Medina to be united with her husband and her child is in her hand. She's in the desert traveling 400 miles from Mecca to Medina and there is a sandstorm and she sees death in her eyes. Her traveling beast runs away. She has no food, no water and suddenly she sees Uthman ibn Talha, a non-Muslim who was the gatekeeper of the Kaaba. He helps her, he assists her, he brings her to Medina. He says, Zawjik, if you have Hil Qarya, your husband is among the people. Good luck to you, woman. He doesn't ask for a thank you, a tap on the shoulder, a cup of water. He comes back. Years later, at Fathai Mecca, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam comes to the Kaaba. Uthman ibn Talha is that non Muslim gatekeeper. He locks the Kaaba and he says, Goodbye, Muhammad. He runs to the roof of the Kaaba and Muhammad summons Ali bin Abi Talib to get the keys and say to him that the Muslim are here never to leave again so Ali goes and he takes the keys forcefully from Uthman ibn Talha the Kaaba is unlocked and Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam makes two rakah of salah in the Kaaba the first and last time Jibreel alayhi salam comes down and he says inna Allah ya'murukum an tu'addu al-amanati ila ahliha return those keys to its rightful belonging, belongers, uh, owners the non-Muslim Uthman ibn Talha. Why? Inna la nudiyu ajara man ahsana amala fa inna Allah la yudiyu ajara al-muhsinin. Because, O oh Muhammad, be advised that this non-Muslim Uthman ibn Talha came to the aid and the assistance of Umm Salama when she was in need of help. And today I have promised that I will never forget the act of goodness of any man, Muslim or otherwise. Return these keys to him. They will belong to him. They will remain with him, his family, his entire generation until Yawmul Qiyamah. Ali turns the keys and he says, because of your one good deed coming to the aid of a Muslim who was in need, Allah is honoring you with the status of being the gatekeeper of the Kaaba and your entire generation until Yawmul Qiyamah. Qad anzal Allah fika Qur'ana. He says, Ashhadu an la ilaha illa Allah wa ashhadu anna Muhammadan abduhu wa rasooluh. What we learn from the story, brothers and sisters, is that if a non-Muslim comes to the aid of a Muslim who is in need, imagine you and me as Muslims coming to the aid of Muslims who are in need. So leave here tonight by giving something because something is better than nothing. 
and I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he accepts it from you, very briefly, within two minutes after the salah, I will ask you to raise your hands and to make a pledge and to encourage others. But if you are in a rush and you need to get back to the mall, right? And you need to get back to your homes, to, with your, to your families, then inshallah, take a pledge form, give something, mail a check, inshallah, and you will be helping and supporting so many who are in need. Allahumma maghfir dhunubana. Allahumma maghfir dhunubana wa astur uyubana. Wa shrah sudurana wa hafaz qulubana wa nawir qulubana. Wa nawir qulubana wa yassir umurana. ويسر أمورنا وحصل مرادنا وتمم تقصيرنا اللهم نجنا مما نخاف اللهم نجنا مما نخاف يا حفي الألطاف أقم الصلاة Please stand up and straighten yourselves and your rows fill in your gaps on the right and left and before you and behind you insha'Allah